Hello friends, welcome to the Homegrown Hopes podcast. I'm your host Caitlin Etheridge and today you are joining me for episode 8. And in this episode I am going to be discussing something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, We're going to be talking about Sunday suppers or if you're from around here, Sunday suppers. (laughs) And I, I feel like I have a disclaimer at the beginning of every episode, but I would like to preface this episode with, I am not telling you you have to do this. I'm not putting this out there to call you out or convict your heart. I also um, am not in a place where I'm hosting Sunday suppers currently. We are in the process of building a home. We're living with family right now, and I don't feel like I have my own space to do that at this moment in my life. So don't feel like if you're in an in-between that I'm calling you out and making you feel guilty because I'm not even doing this right now. But I have done it in the past. And when we are in our new home, Lord willing, sometime this year, I am so ready to do it again. So we're going to be talking about Sunday suppers. And I'm kind of in a weird in-between stage of life, not just with our living situation, but also, um, you know, I'm technically an adult, (laughs) but, uh, just kind of in the, in between, I feel like the older generation in our family still bears a lot of the burden of hosting, um, like growing up and, and still even now, most of our large family holidays, at least on my uh, my side of the family is at my mom's house. She's always hosted it as, you know, since I was a kid. And I think back, I mean, she was my age hosting the entire family at her house. Lots of people I'm talking, let's see, my mom has four siblings. So there's five of them total, lots of cousins, aunts, uncles. It was a house full and still is. Um, it's kind of I guess it's about the same now because we've grown up and gotten married and, you know, everyone has other engagements or they're bringing spouses. So it's probably about the same amount of people as it's always been, plus children. But I just, you know, it can be really overwhelming. And I think she has always hosted it all these years. And I I realize now that, that I'm in this position and coming up to that point in my life, how much work that can be. And so I appreciate that even more. Um, but also I appreciate it so much because uh, I, there are so many great memories. You know, there are so many wonderful memories and it's not just holidays, but that's what comes to my mind. Um, and then on my husband's side of the family, it, for the longest time, it has been his grandmother hosting Sunday dinner, Sunday dinners. And, you know, as we're getting older and we have children and um, I really, when we were still living in our home that we're not living in right now, I really someday want to follow in my mom's footsteps um, and be the one who, who hosts the things, who everyone wants to come to my house. Um, So I started, it's been a couple of years ago, kind of tossed around the idea of it doesn't always have to fall on one person. The burden of dinner does not have to fall on the same person every single week. So we started something and it's gone through seasons of us being really intentional with it. And then some seasons where we're all just busy or life is happening and it hasn't been a consistent every week thing. But we started something called Sunday Supper Club. There's a group text that goes around and it's me and my parents and my husband, and his brother and wife, and my in-laws, and my aunt and uncle-in-law, and my uh, husband's grandparents, and we're all in this Sunday Supper Club group text, and we were really good about it first, about, okay, next week is your week, and you would send out, you know, it's usually around six o'clock, so people can show up early and chit-chat and hang out, and It was whatever you wanted to cook that week. Sometimes, you know, the boys would go fishing that day and we'd have a big fish fry or somebody wanted to try a new recipe out and we would experiment that way. Um, And it, it, it wasn't always just that person cooking either. Sometimes it would be a potluck situation or somebody would say, well, I've got a lot of this coming out of the garden. I'm going to bring a side of this. And it's so nice. Um, 
to to just you know be able to have that kind of fellowship I guess and it is one of my favorite things that we have done and I can't wait to get in my own house and be able to host Sunday suppers I'm so excited and um it's just something that I think and even our old house was really tiny <laughs> like don't think that you have to have a ton of space because the house that we so far in life have raised our children in is less than a thousand square feet and we had Sunday suppers there and people were sitting on the couch and the kids were sitting in the floor and it was just fine. Um, but I, I am excited to have the, the space to host all of that again. But I love the idea of of the the community and the fellowship around this. And like I said, you know, it can be really, really overwhelming to think about hosting people in your home or cooking for that many people. And so I'm kind of just going to hash out how my heart feels about all of this and also maybe some practical ways to implement it in your life. If this is something that you feel like sounds special to you and you'd like to try. So the first thing is maybe you don't live in an area where you have family around and you would still like to be involved in something like this. I did a, an interview on a podcast probably about a month ago. It's the Homestead Challenge podcast. And it was more specifically about building community around the homestead lifestyle. But community and building community is something that's really close to my heart. This season of Homegrown Hopes is brought to you by the Holistic Homestead Conference. Have you ever dreamed of slowing down and becoming more intentional? Of not relying so heavily on the grocery store, but instead honing the skills to grow and preserve your own food and medicine? Have you yearned for a simpler way of life and a community to learn alongside? Then the Holistic Homestead Conference is for you. Nestled in the foothills of Western North Carolina at Henry River Farms, this conference is a way to learn real-life homesteading skills in person and hands-on. We have a lineup of classes including functional medicine, home canning, family dairy, gardening, natural living, and so much more. And did I mention the farm-to-table lunch? VIP ticket holders will get to sit down with all of the instructors and enjoy a lunch prepared by a local chef, and it includes a hog that was actually raised on the farm where the conference is hosted. It doesn't get any fresher than this. Be sure to grab your VIP tickets now because space at the table is limited, but we would love to have you there with us. If you're interested in learning more about the Holistic Homestead Conference and getting your ticket for not just the classes, but also our delicious farm-to-table lunch, then visit www.holistichomesteadconference.com or visit the link in our show notes and use code HOMEGROWN15 for 15% off of your ticket. And I think that, and maybe it's just because I'm older I'm seeing this more, but there are so many people moving to our area. And a lot of these people do not have family moving with them. It's people who are my age who have small children, and they don't have a family support system. And I know that has to be so difficult. Um, And that's, you know, just my life scope speaking there because I'm very close with my family and and my husband's very close with his side and we're all very tight. Um, But I imagine that would be really hard to move off and not have that support system and that closeness. So I think that wherever you are, maybe you really love the idea of Sunday suppers. You know, maybe you have joined a local homeschool group or maybe, and once again, speaking from my life experience, homeschool group comes to mind because that's a big part of my community. Maybe your kid's playing sports. Maybe they've got a friend in school. Maybe you've joined um, a church in the area or you've made friends at work, whatever it may be. Why not just reach out to those people and say, hey, I want to do dinner one night a week. Whether you invite them over to your house or you toss around the idea of doing a Sunday supper club, or maybe I'll just all go out to eat one night a week. Make it fit your life. Or maybe it's not one night a week. Maybe it's one Sunday a month. Y'all all get together and just have a nice group dinner. I love that idea. I think I hear somebody coming up the stairs. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe so. I put a sign on the door. I'll post it in my um Instagram stories. Working from home 
is a blessing and a curse sometimes because my recording studio is a spare bedroom <laughs> and I can hear little feet tiptoeing up the stairs right now. Anyway, so don't feel like, don't feel like it has to be extravagant either. You know, I, I think back to when I was first married and I guess I've always kind of had that hosting gene and never really thought about it until I started thinking through how I wanted to present this topic in this podcast. But when my husband and I were first married, uh, we moved to the other end of North Carolina. We were about four and a half hours from home and knew nobody. He made a couple of friends because he moved down there a few months before we got married. So he had met um, some people who were our age and we're still friends with them today. And um, I was 21 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. I hadn't, you know, I was living away from home, did not have the family support system, but we made a really sweet group of friends and I wanted to be the house that everybody came to. And we were that we were the hangout house. It could be because we were the only ones our age that were married. <laughs> and so everybody could just come to our house because we had our own house. Um, there was one other couple that was married actually, but for a little while we were the only ones that were married. So anyway, but we, I loved being the hostess, you know, having people over and feeling like it was just an open door and you could come in anytime. Um, the only issue, and it wasn't an issue, but it, I would see it as an obstacle now, probably thinking through it is we were broke. We were very financially strained. <laughs> I was in school. Uh, my husband had just started his career and, you know, money was very, very tight. So the idea of cooking supper for a large group of people was probably really overwhelming to me at the time, but I don't remember feeling stressed about that. I just remember it coming together. And my mama was always really good about teaching me how to cook um, meals out of just what you have how to make something out of nothing and scrap something together uh, with leftovers or whatever you have in the pantry. And I, I exercised that muscle <laughs> when we lived uh, down East and had people over and one story comes to mind. So my husband is a, a very big outdoorsman. He hunts and fishes and all those things. And that was one of the way that we were ways that we were able to afford hosting people probably is because I did not have to pay for meat, which is such a huge blessing. We also lived on a huge farm and every now and then I'd walk out on my back deck and one of the farmers in the area, so it's a agricultural area, would have left a 50 pound sack of something on my back deck, whether it was 50 pounds of corn or apples or peanuts, um, or I'd come home and there'd be a basket of cucumbers on my front porch it's one of those things like that community embraced us so much and they, the people were so, so sweet to us. I don't know if they felt sorry for us or if they were just really hospitable people. Um, but somehow it all came together always. And so I can think of one dinner in particular where my husband had been out fishing. He came home with a mess of catfish and I was going to do a fish fry for everybody. Everybody was coming to the house. and. I was digging through the pantry and realized that I didn't have any fish breader and very little flour. But what I did have <laughs> was a box of stale Cheez-Its, which looking back now sounds like a, a very fancy snack at that time. So I don't know. I think that was probably some family had come to visit and and left some Cheez-Its because that sounds like something I would not have <laughs> splurged on. There's a stale box of Cheez-Its in the pantry. And so I crushed them up and made like a cheese it flour. This is so against the, you know, healthy lifestyle I'm preaching now. Um, but I crushed them up and I made cheese it flour. And I breaded the catfish in that and fried them. And it was delicious. So I made do with what I had. Had people over. The dinner was great. And we, you know, we just hung out on the porch and talked and ate catfish and nobody knew that, um, you know, I had been scrambling like, oh my Lord, when am I going to feed these people? But it was fine. It all came together. So I just think about, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be extravagant. 
Maybe you're just really, really good at cooking spaghetti. I personally would not complain if someone had me over to their house on Sundays and fed me spaghetti every Sunday. I would never complain about that. (laughs) If you can cook a, a mean pot of spaghetti, a little side salad and some bread, you have a meal. Or Pinterest a great crock pot meal. Or order, you know, takeout from, I don't know, who does family takeout? Like Denny's or something? I feel like that would be somewhere where you would get a big family sized meal. Um, but I would not complain if someone fed me the same thing each week. And maybe it's not each week. Maybe you do like our family talked about, uh, or like I talked about our family doing and we rotated. There were enough people in the family that I was only cooking dinner like every fifth Sunday or something. It doesn't seem like such a burden when you spread it out like that. So maybe do it with your family, do it with your friends group, maybe spread the love a little bit and don't feel like it has to all be on you. But I think some incredible things can happen around the dinner table. And I think it's such an amazing time for families to come together and to connect and for plans to be made and needs to be spoken out loud and you can pray for each other. And I just think about, you know, the older my children get, the busier we get. Life is not slowing down. Nobody's getting younger. And if you don't schedule in the time to spend time with that older generation, now, I spend a lot of time with my parents because I'm living with them. <laughs> and and really, we do all see our family quite a bit because we all live within like half a mile of each other. <laughs> so we're all pretty close. But even living that close, if we weren't intentional about having dinners together or or, you know, going to each other's sports events or whatever, um, it would be really easy to not see everybody for a few weeks and then be completely disconnected. And that's just something that's really important to us. So. I think about all of the amazing things that happen around the dinner table. And I'm always brought back to all throughout scripture, Jesus fellowships around the table. So many of his lessons and his stories are around the dinner table are sharing food with his disciples or sharing food with his followers. And They were not grand affairs. It was not, you know, these overwhelming feasts. It was simple food. It was fishes and loaves, you know, it was not extravagant, but it was an intentional time and it was really intimate. And I I even think about, you know, in the gospels, you can read about Jesus walking through the grain fields with his disciples and they're eating the grain off the stalks. And as a gardener, I see what a feast that is because it's just so, it speaks to my heart in that way. But so many lessons were taught around a table. I even think about, um, you know, the Last Supper. Jesus took that time. He could have just sat his disciples down and preached to them. But instead, he gathered everyone around the dinner table. And he taught them how to take communion and I just, and, and told them what to expect and spent time just fellowshipping with them. And I just, I don't think that the importance of gathering around a good, simple, humble meal with the people that you love and the people who you want to spend your life with, I don't think the value of that can be underestimated. I just think that it is completely invaluable And even though it may sound like work, (laughs) I don't think that you'll ever regret taking that time. And then, you know, I think about, I'm really bad to do this also. I get called up in the checking the tasks off of my list. Okay, I've cooked this. Now I've got to clean this up. And it's, we have a really bad habit of it (laughs) in my family too, of as soon as we're done eating, we're up doing the dishes. and. And maybe it's not a bad habit because we're all in, you know, the women are in there chit-chatting while we're doing dishes and we're all still talking. But it kind of, when I was researching or just really spending some time in the Word this week, thinking about how I wanted to share this message, um, it brought me back to the story of Mary and Martha. And I have this wonderful book that I I have not finished reading. I've only gotten like a very small portion of this book finished. Um, but it's having a Mary heart in a Martha world. Like I said, I haven't finished it yet, so I'm not going to speak on it too much. But what I have read, um, it really made me think about 
the family dinner. And in the story of Mary and Martha, it's in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus and his disciples are coming through town and they stop at this house of these two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they are fed in this house. And he is talking to everyone. And the the basis of the story is that Martha is bustling around and she's making sure that everyone has what they need and dinner's on time and everything's perfect. And she's cleaning up behind the scenes and her sister Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's really not contributing to the work portion, but she is soaking up every word that comes out of his mouth. And Martha says, and I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have the verse pulled up in front of me, but she pretty much says, are you not going to say something to her? You see me doing all this work and she's not helping me. And Jesus says she has chosen the right thing. Like I said, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not, you know, word for word, but he pretty much says, no, she's do- she's doing the right thing. And I'm not going to, you know, call her down for that because she's made the right decision in this situation. And that made me think about, you know, so often we rush through things and, I don't want to be the person who's so busy cleaning up the dishes that I'm not sitting there listening to a really important story coming from the mouth of someone that I hold, I hold dear and I hold special in my heart. So I think I've covered everything that I want to say about this. I, you know, I don't feel qualified to speak on theology really, but I just, when I think about the family dinner, and it doesn't have to be Sunday suppers. That's just what in my mind traditionally has always been. I just think about the traditions that go along with that. You know, you're spending quality time, but also you're passing on family traditions. I think about, you know, like the Passover meal. That's something that those traditions have been taught through family dinners, through action. Um, I think children learn manners around the dinner table. And sometimes it takes... (laughs) Take some of them longer than others, but uh, you know, I think you know there, that you just can't beat the opportunity to share values <clears throat> at that time. And I don't think there's any. I mean, I've learned some incredible stories about my family that I never even knew around the dinner table, and especially as people in our generation get older and they reminisce and they share on family history. I'm going to get emotional saying this because, sorry, because we have some health issues in our family right now. We have some medical things going on and um, improvements are being made. And I just think that spending that time with the older generation is so precious (sighs) because once they're gone, those stories are gone also. And so anyway, I didn't, I didn't intend for this to be such a heavy episode, but I hope that if you take anything away from today, it's just that even though it is work, it can be work. It doesn't have to be as much work as we probably feel like it's going to be. It doesn't have to be as heavy of a burden as we feel like it's going to be to host people. And, um, even though it does It may feel that way. I really and truly believe that the benefits far outweigh any of the, any of the burden. So I hope that this episode has blessed you and I will be back on Tuesday. (laughs) This episode is actually airing on Thursday. Typically new episodes drop on Tuesdays, um, but life has been happening and it, um, was one of those things that I had to let go for a couple of days this week in order to catch up. So this episode's coming out a couple of days late, but the world keeps spinning. So I hope you guys will um, take the time if you enjoyed this episode to share it on social media or send it to a friend in a text message that really helps the show to get visibility. Um, Also, you can log into whichever platform you're listening on, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or wherever, even on YouTube, I'm there. And take a minute just to rate the show, leave a comment. Uh, That helps so very much. And I would also love to hear your input on topics that you would like for me to discuss. Hope you all have a wonderful week and I will be back to chat with you next Tuesday.